So we're so excited to be here with Dr. Tara Swart, who's just brought out this amazing book called The Signs, and um, we're so excited about it. Um, Dr. Tara, tell us about this book, and um, I'd love to know how we can start living with more awareness and getting into noticing signs around us. Thank you. So um, I'm not sure if you know, but I've often used the hashtag I find hearts. So that was something that was in my life already. Right. And um, when I met my late husband, um, which was on a flight from Johannesburg to London, oh. um, I had written in my journal that if I see three infinity symbols, then the person I'm going to marry is already in my life. But I didn't think it was going to be him. And then I saw, I flew to a conference in Turkey and I saw a man with a wedding ring with the infinity symbol engraved on it. Ah. Then I saw an elastic band on the pavement in London in the shape of an infinity symbol a few days later. And then I was sitting on the train, on a really crowded train. There was a girl standing in front of me with short jeans and a gap where her, her ankle was before her shoe. And she had an infinity symbol tattooed on her ankle. I mean, these are so random. random. Yeah. Um, and then... A few months later, I, I did start to have a relationship with Robin, and I looked back and I saw that, and I kind of, it was a bit too much to take in, so I just thought, that's kind of strange, maybe it was my intuition. And then, I wouldn't say I really thought about signs again until Robin passed away. Right. And I had heard people who'd had loss say that they got signs from their lost loved ones, and I was desperate to get a sign. But I was trying too hard and nothing was happening, except I kept seeing robins in the garden. Right. And I was living between two houses. One was in London, one was in the countryside. But both houses, every time I went to the window, I would see a robin in the garden. Um, <clears throat> and then out of sort of desperation, really, I consulted a medium. And I was very sceptical. I kept my scientific head on. And I thought, if there's anything that could have been looked up on the internet or social media, then I, I can't take that as meaning that this person actually knows something. Right. Um, and eventually, I just thought, if it's possible to channel communication with lost loved ones, and Robin and I were so close, and he was my husband, and I you know, called him my twin flame, mm. then I should be able to do it myself. Right. So I started then asking him and being more open, and then sort of setting, sometimes setting something that, would be a sign, like something quite unusual, like at one point I asked for the sign of a phoenix, because I was going through this phase of feeling like I'd totally burnt out and I had to like start over. Right. And then I was in Oklahoma City, and every time I went from the hotel to the studio, I passed a Chinese restaurant called Phoenix Garden. Um, wow. And then I had to catch a flight at short notice, and I was meant to get a direct flight to LA, but at the last moment, and this was on the day of the second anniversary of him passing, I had to fly through Phoenix, Arizona. So I've got so many more stories like that, but I then, I think a lot of people identify with the number 11 or 1111. Yes. I would see that a lot, and that made sense, because he was my twin flame. Um, so if you look up angel numbers, 11 has to do with being twin flames. Yes. But then I started seeing 44 everywhere, and I didn't know why, and I looked it up, and it meant your angels are guiding you and protecting you and telling you that you're on the right path. And this was at a time I was really struggling. So that's become right. a special number to me from him. It also made sense that numbers would be a way he would communicate with me because he was in, in like an, a numbers kind of job. Right. And he was obsessed with the Fibonacci sequence. Ah, okay. So that was like a bit of a light bulb moment for me that numbers would really make sense. But I also get song lyrics, um, obviously Robin's. And um, once, when my friend came over to my house and said he'd had a vision of Robin standing in the hallway, and I felt like a message was going to come through him. And nothing happened that evening, but the next morning he sent me a text saying that he was upset about something. And I thought, I don't think he was that upset. I think this is coming from Robin. Right. And then this light bulb started flickering in the ceiling, and I was videoing it to show my friend. I said, at the moment that you messaged me with that, which I feel is actually a message from Robin. This light started flickering. And on the video, you can hear me saying, if it's you, darling, make the light stop. And then it stops. And wow. my friend is a skeptic. But he, he was like... He was moved by that. He was moved by that. And what mm -hmm. we kind of agreed between us in the end was, 
if if you are a skeptic, which I think you know there will be people, mm. then where we think these signs come from doesn't actually matter. What matters is how you interpret it and what effect that has yes. on your life. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 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 So, I mean, I think we used to live a lot more in the ancient times with the signs, you mm. know, like the moon used to be a thing and mm. animals that came into your life. And mm. yeah. So I think, especially now with, with um, fake news, I mean, we, we, we don't know what we're watching, whether what we're watching is true or not. I think it's a perfect time for people to start enhancing their intuition mm. and um, try and yeah, get stronger intuitive yeah. abilities to to yeah know what's really true. How 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 does one do that? Um, I just want to reiterate what you said and and say that I think the really human capabilities like intuition and creativity and empathy are the things that are going to help us to survive in this time of you know such a rapid rise of, of AI and other technologies. Um, so what I've written about in the book, and I I also want to add on to something else that you said. Um, in the book I've written that in ancient times we had to use our senses to interpret the world around us mm. and so a cloud formation could mean that rain was coming but it could also be a message from ancestors because there's a lot of ancestor worship and you know whether they came as so in I worked in um, Aboriginal Australia as a psychiatrist and the Aboriginal liaison officer told me that because um, there are lots of white cockatoos there, they're very common birds there, but they're so, so beautiful. Um, but there's a very rare black cockatoo, and he told me that when they see black cockatoos, they believe it's their ancestors right. coming back in bird form. And I think there are a lot of, you know, there will obviously be like, you know, African beliefs that your yes. readers will be more familiar with. Um, so, yeah, basically going back to that sense of trusting your instincts. Um, and what a whole chapter in the book is about the fact that intuition is thought of as a mental capacity and therefore that it's in your brain and in your neurons. And we go as far as to say it, it might also be in the gut neurons and that's why it's yeah. that instinct. But if you think about Bessel van der Kolk's work on the body keeps the score yes. and the way that trauma is held in the body is not just in the PTSD circuits of the yes. brain, it's in the fascia and the musculature. And um, people in that sort of area of somatic, work you know yeah. using the body to release trauma using the body to release trauma um say that there's the part of the brain that articulates speech actually gets shut down by trauma so there's a limit to how far talking therapy can help or right. journaling mm. um and it's same with intuition is hidden wisdom is held in the body just like trauma is yeah. and the way to access that is through yoga dance chanting, drumming, yes. anything that kind of, you know, gets the body moving and sort of like allows you to access that brain-body connection. Yes, exactly. I love that saying, the issue is in the tissue. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I know that one. Yeah, I know, and, and also with various yoga classes, certain postures bring out, you know, I've, I've had somebody in a yoga class where they're next to me and they literally start crying yeah. because of the posture is actually accessing that part of trauma yeah. that's stored in the body yeah so so yeah. i mean i think it's quite well known that hip opening yoga poses yes. can like release a lot of emotions but i've actually got a story about that that i haven't shared in the book or elsewhere which is that robin when he was still alive was um had severe osteoarthritis in his right hip right. and was due for a hip replacement and so we had planned it months in advance because I had to take six weeks off work to nurse him. And he'd also paid for my best friend in Australia, who's a nurse, to come over to England to help me. Um, but then he shared the story of being abandoned by his father with me, and it's the only time I've seen him cry. So as he was falling asleep every night for two weeks, I whispered, because I thought hips are emotions, and yes. the right side is the father. So I whispered in his ear every night, you've got to let go of these emotions that you're still holding on to about your father. He didn't even know I did it because he was asleep, so I was subliminal messaging him. Wow. And I, I still can't believe this, but he woke up one day, two weeks later, and said to me, I'm cancelling my hip operation. And I said, no, you can't. Like, we've <laughs> arranged it all, and I'm, you know, I've taken time off work, especially, and everything. He went, I'm not in pain. 
Wow. And it was so profound because it was psychological as well as, as well as physical. Wow. And of course, you know, his life was cut short by leukemia, but he never had to have that hip replacement. Unbelievable. Did you tell him? But you did, no. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Wow. I think that's the thing we so cut off, you know, if mm. we could actually just tune into our bodies and listen to them mm. and also watch the signs around mm. us. I remember once we were working, um, we were doing a project and we were going to walk through the desert and it was televised and everything and we were doing all the publicity and it was crazy and mm. we got to the desert and then we were barefoot and I was sitting there and all these ants came crawling on my feet but the person next to me had no ants on there. Oh. I was like, what's going on? And they said to me, yes, because you've got such frenetic energy, you're mirroring it in the, in the room running around in the ants, you know. Wow. And I thought, wow, that would have been such a good lesson for me to say, okay, calm down, Robin, you're creating ant activity around you, you know. So I, I think those kinds of, you know, things yeah. that we can learn from our environment and how we're reflecting our environment are just invaluable. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think a really easy way to explain it to people, if the, the theory that I've given might still take people a while to really, for it to land for them is, have you ever had a visceral reaction to something? Have you had a piece of news and had a shiver go down your spine or butterflies in your stomach or goosebumps? Yes. I mean, in my friendship group, it's very common to respond to a profound state statement by saying, oh, that gave me goosebumps or chills. Yes. But what does that actually mean? Yes. It's our body experiencing an intense emotion or an intuitive insight. Mm -hmm. So what I'm really saying to a friend, if I say that is, I agree with you deep down, and that showed up, showed up on my body. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I love all those things. Like he was livid, and you know, you saw that mm. that in your in your liver. Mm. That's the angry organ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So beautiful. And the word lunatic comes from lunar cycles. Exactly. Um, because when the moon is full, and it's that much brighter, people don't sleep as well. So they're more likely to become disturbed if right. they're lacking sleep. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so what we can expect from your book <laughs> is to learn a lot about how to tune into these cycles, what to what to look for, and yeah. how to become more at one with our with our surroundings. And yeah, it's it's a lot about intuition. each chapter kind of starts with connect with, and so the first one is connect with your senses because I did a literature review and found that we have currently known thirty four senses. Now most people think we have five. Maybe they're aware of a sixth sense, but um, most people certainly don't know that we have 34. So it's about, you know, the knowledge of that allows you to tap in if you wish yes. to. You can't tap into something if you don't know it exists. Sure. But I've also used that as a bit of an analogy for saying, what are we capable of tapping into in our consciousness and our minds? And so I then go through the intuition chapter to the receiving signs from lost loved ones or the source or universal God or whatever, wherever you believe these signs might be coming from. Right. I think the step change from my previous book, The Source, is that that was very much about your cognitive capabilities and, you know, relying on yourself to manifest things that you visualized. This is saying we have all that capability and that's great, but we're also connected to something greater. We don't quite understand what it is. Right. But if we can learn to tap into that, life is totally different. Right, right. And, and Tara, do you speak to us a little bit about the, your the gut-brain axis? You've mm. done so much beautiful work on that. Mm. Yeah. It was actually quite shocking to me to look back at the source and see that I'd written a very short sort of paragraph or two on the gut-brain axis. This time, I've made it into a triangle rather than just the axis. So it's the gut, the gut microbiome, and the brain. And there's, it's actually a triangular relationship. Right. Um, and there's a lot you can do to improve the quality and quantity of your gut microbiome, all the good bacteria that are in there, right. um, which, if they're not healthy, can cloud your access to your intuition. So your wow. gut physically and the microbiome need to be in good order so important for, that, yeah. for that to happen. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, so they communicate with each other mainly through the vagus nerve, which is the longest cranial nerve that comes from the skull via the lungs and the diaphragm into the gut. Um, but also other nerves called enteric nerves, which innervate the organs of the gut, um, hormones, and different chemical messages called cytokines, which are also secreted into the blood and help communication between those three um, axes. Um, and, and the easiest way to influence your gut microbiome is the way that you eat. 
Right. So if you start to change your diet, then in about two days, your gut microbiome will, will flourish. Um, and that's generally currently advised to be 30 different plant products a week. And that's not as hard as it sounds because things like coffee and black pepper count. And if you eat red tomatoes and yellow tomatoes, they count as two different right. plant products. Um, and also eating for your cultural heritage. Right. So, you know, the, the, the consultant dietitian reminded me that I should, you know, am I eating enough Indian spices because that would be better for my gut microbiome. So if you know what your cultural heritage is, to kind of try to bring that in. So, for example, coconut oil might be really good for me, but it might not be really good for you. Right, right. Okay, super. Mm. Have you been influenced a lot by the Ayurvedic system? Um, my mum kind of brought us up that way, but I think growing up in London, I just wanted to fit in with my friends, and I thought she was really woo-woo. <laughs> um, and she used to say things like, you know, turmeric can cure cancer, and, and we would just, like, giggle. But then I went to medical school and found out that curcumin is highly anti-inflammatory and does help with right, right. Uh, bowel cancer prevention and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's I, – I had to eat humble pie because that's a definite case of ancient wisdom, you know, that science right. is only just catching up with. Yeah. So I've noticed through all my times of writing about food, like, different ones come into um, – fashion or into vogue and then disappear again so um i was i was just wondering what you thought of manuka honey because that seems to be coming up now quite a lot um and, and especially for the for the biome um i've known about manuka honey for many years i would say okay yeah, yeah. okay yeah. no it has been around but it yeah. seems to be coming Is it more popular now oh popularity yeah. it's been spoken about a lot more yeah now. yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm into all those things. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, super. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited we're all going to dive into your book thank and you. start getting more intuitive. <laughs> so it's, it, it's available on Child, right? It yes. is. And I just wanted to say that it's actually not due for release in the UK and the USA until September 16th. But because I've been here speaking at this conference, Penguin allowed early release in, in South Africa on August 22nd. And it just makes my heart so happy because I love South Africa that you all can have this book before anyone else in the world. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. You're welcome. <laughs>